Okay, so I'm going to start recording, and um, and it's 12:15. We already have about 17, 18 people. Uh, I guess we should begin. Okay. So, um, and Dax, I just made you a co-host, and so if you can help admit some of the people while I introduce Joan, okay? Got it. Okay. So, uh, so welcome everyone to the C's Colloquium. We have another uh, excellent speaker today, Dr. Joan Peterson. Um, just so you know, for a protocol, if you have any questions, please hold off until the end of the talk. Uh, if you feel a little shy, you can just type it into the chat and we'll read it to her, of course. So, uh, and some uh, little current events. Next week, we're gonna have two graduate students from Queens College, from Dr. McHugh's lab, uh, give talks. So you should definitely think about uh, coming next week as well. So to our speaker, um, Dr. Joan Peterson, received a PhD in biology from Fordham University in 1999 and has been teaching at the Queensborough Community College since 2002. She is the coordinator of the uh, Queensborough Community College Environmental Science Program and mentors students in research projects related to the roles of microorganisms in nature. Uh, in her role as faculty coordinator for the undergraduate research, she supports faculty who mentor research students in all disciplines. And as many of the students know, here, um, many of faculty and C's, we take on uh, undergraduate uh, students to do research in our own labs. In addition, Joan is the faculty liaison of the program STEP, the Science and Technology Entry Program. Um, this is a New York State Education Department funded program where she was the, one of the original PIs and co-directors of it from its inception at Queensborough Community College in 2006 until just this past year. And this is an amazing program. It's a program for seventh to 12th graders who are, who are from historically underrepresented, economically disadvantaged uh, situations. The goal is to improve their skills in science and math and then prepare them for college and encourage them to, con to, uh, to consider careers in STEM fields. And so we've been getting lots of Queens, uh, Queensboro students into our program. So thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. And so in addition to all the uh, amazing educational work she's doing, she's also doing research on very topical environmental subjects. And in fact, uh, the research project she's going to talk about today is in our own backyard, the New York City, uh, New York City parks. And so the title of her talk is called Mentoring of a Vernal pool restoration site in northeastern Queens. And so welcome, Joan, to the C's Colloquium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen, for the great introduction. I'm very happy to be here uh, with you. I was scrolling through the, the names here, and I see some familiar names. And I'm happy to see that some of the students that have actually worked on this project are, are here. So hi, guys. Uh, at, I was actually supposed to give this talk almost a, a year ago, and then uh, I remember Jillian said, do you want to do it now or wait till we're back in person? I'm like, oh, let's wait till we're back in person. I'd rather come and see you. And here we are a year later, and we're, we're, zooming. we're, we're yeah, still Zooming. <laughs> but I am happy to be here and at least see your uh, names and, and faces of those of you who I recognize. All right. So I'm going to be telling you about a project that I have done that involved a lot of student work. These are work done with my uh, environmental science and ecology students at Queensboro. Uh, I was always interested in getting them out in the field and getting them to, uh, you know, take samples and see what's going out on in our urban environment. And then uh, we got very, very fortunate and to meet uh, Brady Simmons from New York City Parks, who was also here, by the way. Uh, so uh, this was a great partnership because they had just done this vernal pool construction in an area very close to campus and we needed something to study. So it just worked out that uh, we started working on this. So this is the project I'll be talking about. Um, I actually put the acknowledgements here at the beginning just to give the shout outs right away so we don't run out of time or forget later. Uh, so these are other folks that Brady brought on, on board to work with us to help us look and identify the invertebrates and the uh, odinates. So we have Katie Friedman, Clara, Ellen Novum help with the soils. Uh, we had uh, help, I had Ashley Smith who is here and she was my student and also worked as a peer mentor through that HSI grant program that our colleges have in common. Uh, 
we did receive some funding for part of the project from Authentic Research and Microbiology. Uh, that's an NSF funded project that was uh, Theodore Muth at uh, Brooklyn College and Avram Kaplan, who was then at the CUNY Office of Research had. And that was the funding for the metagenomic uh, analyses that we're gonna talk about later on. And uh, a colleague from our department who encouraged me to do course-based research. Up until that point, it was one-on-one -on -one research and I was, well, let's bring it into the classroom. Um, and I'm very appreciative of that because I love doing it like this. And the final shout out there then is to all my former students in both classes that were involved in this project. So I'm gonna start out just uh, defining what uh, makes a vernal pool a vernal pool, what's important about them um, in terms of uh, habitat, uh, and then talk about the restoration project for uh, vernal pools at Alley Pond Park, how our students got involved, the things that we monitored, which included water, soil chemistry, well, invertebrate survey, and the microbial analyses, and then our conclusions and future plans. These pictures, by the way, that don't have things underneath them that tell you where they're from are actually from the Vernal Pool site. And they were taken by my students, right? So these are all uh, in the shared Google Drive. Uh, and so this is one of the Vernal Pools that we were studying. So EPA definition of a Vernal Pool, seasonal depression of wetlands that occur and under the Mediterranean climate conditions of the West Coast and glaciated areas of Northeastern and Midwestern states. They're covered by shallow water for very long periods from winter to spring, but may be completely dry for most of the summer and fall. So that's the kind of official EPA definition. So let's just break that down a little bit. What they are is small, relatively shallow, ephemeral water bodies. So they're, they're part of the year, dried up other parts of the year. Um, unlike lakes or ponds, they don't have a permanent inlet or outlet. So the water uh, that fills these primarily from rainfall and snow melt in the spring. Um, they would usually, uh, the drying up would occur in the summer or that can go into the fall as well. And because of these very varied conditions, dry, wet, this is a, a rather harsh habitat for uh, organisms and re uh, represents a kind of unique type of wetland. So where do we find uh, vernal pools? So we have natural pools that would occur in upland um, areas of shallow depressions. Some of them are associated with larger wetland complexes um, near floodplains of streams and rivers. In the Northeast, generally our natural pools are associated with some forested landscape. All right, uh, but there's also uh, pools that on, in agricultural areas that, where, that are created um, on, on the farm or in residential areas like ponds that people put in their backyards. For oh, example. sorry. You got sick shell. Huh? You got sick shell. Everybody needs to mute. <laughs> so why, why are wet, first, why are wetlands in general important? Right, and then we'll talk specifically about vernal pools. So the wetlands have a lot of um, in, important uh, purposes uh, in our lives, of course, in, in nature, they absorb excess precipitation and runoff. Uh, so they help to mitigate flooding, improve water quality by removing uh, impurities. And in New York City, wetlands in general are, uh, you know, help to manage the stormwater in, in a very built environment. Right? Uh, they also supply uh, their supply of water and food for other organisms that would come by and visit. Like in the picture here, we have some, some ducks, some other uh, birds would stop by, uh, grab some, grab a snack, grab lunch, right? Uh, they're pretty, they're nice to look at. So we have aesthetic value and of course, educational value. Who doesn't like to go to a, a little pond or a vernal pool with a dip net or a plankton net to see what uh, organisms are there? bird watchers enjoy them as well for the, the waterfowl. So those are some importance. Another in, importance in terms of habitat is, as I say, advantages of being small are that these conditions where the pools are sometimes wet and sometimes dry uh, means that you have to be adapted to be able to survive there. And what it also means is that there's not going to be any fish, right? And that's really important if you're an amphibian or an invertebrate who's laying eggs and then those eggs are developing in their larval stages. In the pool, you're gonna have a lot less predation if you don't have fish present. So if uh, you're an organism that can survive that drying period, but you're not getting eaten, 
all good, right? So uh, there are species that are uh, that exist in um, these habitats that are called obligate species, which means that they require this um, alternating wet dry cycle to survive. And then a number of facultative species, which can survive elsewhere. They could survive in ponds and, and lakes as well, but they benefit greatly from having this habitat where there's going to be this reduced predation because there's no fish. All right, so just a few examples of vernal pool inhabitants. This is the ones that are found uh, in, in our area, uh, in other vernal pools at Alley Pond. The spotted salamander, which um, in its adult form would be living uh, more in the, in the woodlands, right? Uh, but the, the eggs here, this is an egg case, which uh, they like to lay their eggs attached to some vegetation here and our, our larval stage, right? Uh, they like to have the leaf litter at the bottom to hide under for protection. And so they really like vernal pools for their breeding. Here's our wood frog. Um, and this frog also likes, can survive in other ponds, but would use a vernal pool for, for the breeding purposes, because again, you don't have predation on the uh, eggs in the in the tadpoles, right? The adults then would live in the woodlands. Uh, this species is has a pretty broad habitat range, so right now it's not a very much concern in terms of uh, numbers. But as these habitats decrease, um, they may become rarer. All right, and now we have a an obligate species that relies on the uh, vernal pools exclusively, and this is the vernal fairy shrimp. Right, so these are small crustaceans. Some of you may Look at these pictures. So those things kind of look familiar. So there's there's marine uh, species in the same group that are like brine shrimp. You may have heard of um, anybody had sea monkeys when they were a kid. Um, the, these are uh, related to those organisms, and, and they rely on and they're actually adapted specifically to the vernal pool. They're only active a couple of weeks, depending on the species uh, each year. Uh, when the eggs are formed, they're actually uh, fully formed eggs, uh, which they're called cysts, uh, which can survive the desiccation, that drying period. They could survive years of that, right? And actually when the species does reproduce, it, some of the eggs will hatch right away. And then there's always a bank of eggs that, that are left there and don't hatch. Uh, so that they're there in case they don't have enough of that, you know, if things dry out too soon before they're able to develop, those eggs are kind of there for the for subsequent years. They are listed as vulnerable by IUCN, so a little bit more in trouble, of course, because they rely on these vernal pools. Whoop. There's a red line on my slide. <laughs> Where'd that come from? I didn't do that, did I? Okay, um, so who else uh, is there? We have a number of other types of organisms like uh, what you have in the picture. These are again pictures taken by my students of uh, the odonates, damselflies and dragonflies that use this habitat. Uh, some of uh, species in those groups are threatened or in, um, threatened species, so their numbers are in trouble. You've got beetles, mollusks, some of them spend their entire life um, at the, in the vertical pool. A number of different types of plants, including cattails and rushes and sedges, uh, really vary very much with what type of canopy you have and, and what the location of the pool is. You've got phytoplankton, zooplankton, and of course, my friends, the bacteria, right? And so we're gonna talk about the, them, the, a lot of the, the work that we've done is microbial analyses, because that's my field. But, you know, in looking up information about this, there's not a lot known about microbial communities in vernal pools. So this is an area that needs some attention. What are th uh, threats to wetland? We have habitat loss, of course, is number one threat to a lot of our uh, species, right? Habitat fragmentation. We have a road in between areas. We we're affecting dispersion. Um, estimates are in the last 200 or up until 1980s, about 60% of wetlands in New York were lost due to uh, this you know, building development. Altered hydrology, changes in the water table, uh, changes in water quality. Uh, more, what, what enters the, the wetlands in uh, terms of runoff, right? What, what's in that, that water, what the water level is. 
And so that applies to wetlands in general. And then vernal pools are particularly in trouble because they're not protected, right? So uh, there's federal protection and uh, DEC protects freshwater wetlands that are greater than 12.4 acres in size. And vernal pools are sometimes are isolated and, and of course much smaller than that. So they don't have any protection. In New York City, this is a map taken, a lot of these images are taken from uh, New York uh, City Parks um, report uh, about this construction of vernal pools. Um, and of course, historically, wetlands, vernal boats, yucky, it's mucky. There's a lot of bugs there. You know, we have this waste we need to get rid of. Let's, let's fill it in, right? We fill it in to have land for development and fill it in to get rid of that mucky, yucky, bug stuff, right? Uh, not realizing how important they are. Uh, and so a lot of these, including this area that we're talking about, have very sandy soils uh, that are the result of the sand and other construction debris being dumped there. The map here is showing where it, uh, in New York City we still have vernal pools, and you can see there's not a lot of dots here. Most of our uh, dots are in Staten Island. Right? This is where we have the most vernal pools left in New York City. Uh, over here in the Bronx and Van Cortland Park, and then a few close to us in, uh, we have Alley Pond and Cunningham Park. So, um, the uh, restoration, we, I, I'm calling it a restoration, technically I realize we shouldn't be calling it a restoration, but a construction, uh, because it, it was not, restoration would be if you're getting it back to what it was before, and this was not a vernal pool area. Uh, more than a century ago when it started getting dumped in, it was initially salt marsh area, right? So it's actually a construction. Uh, New York City Parks evaluated the, the area, came up with a plan and started the construction in 2016. It was completed in 2017. And this is the first vernal pool restoration or construction in New York City, right? So this has not been done before. It's been done in many areas, you see the reference down here at the bottom that uh, where the uh, information, uh, the guidance that was followed by parks to reconstruct this pool uh, came from. And there are other guides about how to, how to reconstruct your vernal pool areas, uh, but never before in New York City. All right. And so uh, this was done by New York City Parks with the goals of providing additional vernal pool habitat for uh, species that uh, exist in Ellie Pond Park. And then uh, to monitor it, look at the water level, the temperature, the hydro period, how, it, how often they're wet or, or dry, right? And what species come and start using uh, the area. And so the, and with the, you know, the ultimate goal of looking, is this something that we can do in other areas to uh, restore this habitat? So here's the location of where the vernal pools are. It, it's a long walk, but you can walk from, from Queensboro, um, just for your point of reference. So it's Queens folks here. This is Alley Pond Environmental Center, which is actually under construction and has moved now. But um, we have the Cross Island Parkway over here. Northern Boulevard here. This is the driving range across the street, right? Uh, and then there's a small entrance into Alley Pond Park over here. In between, a, there's a car wash and a, and a used car sales lot, right? And then that's, this is the location where uh, the restoration or construction occurred, right? Here's another picture that shows us a little more clearly. Uh, one of the reasons that this area was chosen was because there was a pool that had kind of formed naturally. So this is going to be referred to as the reference pool in the talk. Um, some of the later slides, it's also called the control pool, but this is, this is the natural one, right? And then the plan was developed to um, create these three constructed pools. So they're pools A, B, and C. They were constructed in different ways. Um, so after looking at the hydrology and realizing that the water table was shallower in, in this region, uh, pool A was restored without putting in a liner. Pools B and C had a, a deeper water table and they were con there was concern that all the water would just seep out right away. And so they were uh, restored with liners underneath to try to hold that water in place more off for, for a longer period of time. All right, and so for us, this was like 
an experiment in the field, like let's see what's happening at these different uh, uh, pools. And we have a we have an outgroup our control pool as well to, for comparison. Uh, some of the restoration was done with the uh, soil that was uh, taken out and 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 sieved uh, to remove larger debris. Uh, some uh, soil was also imported to help fill in uh, and make the slopes of the pool. And they specifically look for low nutrient, particularly phosphorus, to not you know, introduce eutrophication here. And uh, the uh, construction uh, fill that was there tends to be alkaline. And so they were looking for uh, more acidic soils to, to bring in. Here's a, a picture that just kind of kind of shows a general schematic of how uh, it was done. So you have here, you could see all this ur urban fill above the historic salt marsh uh, liners, but only in pools B and C, right? And then this gradation here, the slopes being made on the side and vegetation and um, native trees uh, also planted here, trees and shrubs. This is just a picture I included because I thought this was pretty cool in the excavation, New York City parks and they found in this location here, uh, we have a, a remains of a car and this apparently is a cylindrical bank vault here. So a lot of junk just thrown here that had to be uh, cleaned out. All right, so the next uh, few slides show the initial uh, assessment of the restoration by parks, right? So these are graphs created by uh, parks personnel to, uh, they monitored from uh, April uh, to September of 2017 our uh, temperatures, right? And you can see they follow a typical pattern with the seasons, right? We're warming up in the, in the summer and then starting to cool down in the fall. Uh, one notable thing though is the, the control pool, the one that was not restored, uh, has a higher temperature and it's about five degrees higher uh, temperature here in, in late summer than the others. And you see that that line just ends here and you'll see why on the next slide, because here we have measurements uh, from April to April of the depth. And you see here in September, October that our, our natural or reference pool did dry up completely. I also had a dry period in May. But the other thing that you notice here is that none of the other pools dried up completely, right? So the one that was closest to it was the uh, Pool A, which is the one that does not have the liner, that's the yellow line here, uh, sorry, the orange line. Pools B and C, which were restored with the liner, never got below about, the uh, lowest was about uh, 60 centimeters, which is about two feet, right? And then Pool C is even as high as uh, almost uh, three feet in depth. And, and it dropped down a little bit in those uh, fall months, but never dried completely. They did in this surveys in uh, 2017 see almost immediately amphibians, aquatic invertebrates start coming around saying, oh, cool, new place to hang out, right? So tadpoles, uh, American toads were uh, observed. Uh, they didn't see the egg masses, but they did see the adults and the tadpoles. So they started breeding there right away. Odinids or dragon dragonflies, damselflies started colonizing right away as well. Algae, cattails, uh, other plants also observed uh, almost immediately. And then here we get it's time for Queensboro to step in. So Brady Simmons and I, you know, met and talked about this and said, well, we have that data, but let's see what else is going on. We could see that what's occurring at these pools. So as I mentioned, for I have uh, for three semesters, I took students out into the field and and um, we collected some data on soil and, and water quality and did some microbial analyses. So um, if you're here and you're in the pictures, I'm sorry, <laughs> but you all look great. Um, we did uh, in fall 2018 is when we started with a, a qualitative odonate survey, to see what, what uh, dragonflies, damselflies we could find, uh, water quality parameters, pH, nitrate, phosphate, DO and some other parameters as well. We tested the soil for texture, pH, and a bunch of macro and micronutrients. And then we have our microbial analyses, which included heterotrophic plate counts, uh, detection of uh, fecal coliform bacteria. This was using a, 
an auger plate that detects uh, E. coli. Screening for actinomycetes, uh, which are uh, microbes that are some of our natural antibiotic producers. They make other uh, metabolites as well. And then um, in fall 2018, we had also the funding to do the microbial community profile uh, from that ARAM project funding. All right, um, spring 2019, which is this picture here, uh, we have we did water and soil parameters. Here we added in, the first one is just with Lamont kits. This time we use some hatch kits as well. And microbial analyses, again, the plate counts and using that EMB auger. And then in fall 2019, we added in a, a quick survey of uh, benthic invertebrates in the pools. Again, soil and water quality and microbial analysis, this time uh, using um, an enter alert system to look for another fecal contamination indicator. I'll talk more about those in a little bit. So here are some of our results and what's shown in red is kind of stuff that, that you know I'm highlighting that's sticking out. So this is some of some of the water quality data from fall 2018. Uh, pH in all the pools is slightly alkaline but a little bit lower at pool C, but keep that number in mind when we as we move on, 7.5 pH. All right, um, at this sampling point, our phosphate was a little higher than, than we'd like it to be here. Dissolved oxygen, a little lower than we'd like it to be. Alkalinity is high in all of the pools, particularly in the uh, pool A, all right? And then a lot of the other things that we measured were either undetected or um, at very low levels. So that's fall 2018. This is fall 2018 and spring 2019 uh, data from, uh, microbial data. And so uh, in these semesters, we just looked at the water and I have plate counts as uh, this is times 10 to the fifth, right? So one thing to notice here is pools A, B, and C are kind of similar. C is a little bit higher, but look at the reference pool. It's 10 times higher uh, bacterial counts. And the first time I, I saw this, I said, okay, they did the dilutions wrong. Let's do this again and again. And it kept coming to the same thing. <laughs> Uh, so much, much higher bacterial, total bacterial numbers by plate count, at least, uh, in our naturally occurring pool, right? And these are the numbers from fall 2018, but we had similar uh, results in uh, 2019 as this. And these plates, in fact, that are being shown here are from the spring 2019 survey. You could see that the number of colonies are much higher on the um, reference pool plate as compared to the uh, pools uh, B, there are two and three here, but it's B, pools B and C. All right, also from fall 2018, we have uh, soil analyses. So uh, all of them were around pH seven, uh, sulfate, chloride, calcium, all these things, normal range, little bit that outliers with the uh, magnesium being low in some of the soils, manganese being uh, low uh, near some of the pools as well. We had high nitrates in the in the reference pool um, and potassium levels were low everywhere. Uh, the graph is showing the soil texture part uh, analysis, which is just looking at the uh, the size of the soil particles and as expected in all of them about 60% uh, sand. No, no surprise there. We do see a little bit uh, difference in you know, the reference pool with the is more of a higher proportion of silt, which is the middle size particle, right, versus the uh, near the restored one where we have a higher proportion of clay than silt. This is probably the result of those uh, constructed soils, uh, the constructed pools having some imported soils that may have uh, uh, changed the size of the particles in the soil a little bit. All right, here's our uh, spring 2019 water quality data. Keep in mind that the, the, all of these, the measurements were done in some different ways, but uh, again, the red is, uh, what I wanna highlight here is pool C now, which was, was 7.5 to begin with. Now we're getting pH of much higher pH, 9.25, where the other ones have, have decreased somewhat, all right? Uh, our phosphate levels are okay everywhere, except the reference pool is a little bit high. Uh, we were also able in this sampling time to do turbidity. So you see that reference pool and pool A, uh, turbidity is higher. So the water 
uh, column is not, not as clear, right? Much lower in pools B and especially pool C. And then um, our dissolved inorganic nitrogen, which we also did in the field, we see a big difference between the reference pool and pool A, that's the one without the liner, remember, and pools B and C, which have the liners. And we either have very uh, low dissolved organic nitrogen or even below detection for pool B. So we're seeing some, some differences here and some things that are more similar uh, between the reference pool and, and pool A starting to pop out, right? Uh, this is showing, uh, looking at E. coli on an e EMB agar plate. Interesting, we didn't find any in any of the water samples, but this green metallic sheen that you see here is uh, from one of the, uh, from the soil samples shows uh, some possible um, E. coli contamination in the soil. And here, Ashley Mercado, thank you for doing this beautiful chart rather than those other tables, which I was kind of assembling, um, taking the, the data from the spreadsheet at this point. Um, Ashley had put this was in the class and put this beautiful uh, chart together. So I, I borrowed it from, from Ashley's uh, notes that she put together for the class. But again, um, what I wanna point out here is again, look at, we have now three different readings and this time we're using a YSI meter, so we're doing the pH readings in the field very quickly, right? So pool C, three different readings, all again on the alkaline side, whereas these guys are back to kind of being neutral, right? And very, very high uh, dissolved oxygen in pool C is, as well, much higher than uh, at the other sites. We don't have data from a September 19th for, for water for the reference pool, because it was dry when we went to do the sampling. So uh, no aquatic samples were available. It was acting like a vernal pool. Here's our data in terms of uh, bacterial counts on plate counts. So uh, for water, and this time we did soil as well. And what we can see here uh, is we have more variability in, in the uh, plate counts for total numbers of, of bacteria. Um, that very different even that we don't we don't have the reference pool but we can see here uh, lower values at uh, sorry lower values here at pool c the lowest values at pool c um, big you know, order of magnitude less than um, pool a and then uh, pool b has the the highest of the ones that we measured these are uh, just make note of, of this this is 10 to the fourth colony forming units per ml and the soil is 10 to the seventh, right? And so uh, these are much higher values of, uh, of bacteria in the soil overall than in the water. Uh, but we also have on um, pool C, soil and water, both are our lowest total bacterial counts, right? And then the column on the right here is uh, showing here, we use this enter alert system and so this is a way of detecting enterococcus, which is another indication um, like using E. coli to detect fecal contamination. I'm just gonna go to the next slide for a second to show what these look like if you're not familiar. Um, so you have a water sample, you mix it with a, a nutrient that if, the, if you have enterococcus bacteria there, it will react um, and will have the enzyme react you know, with that substrate and you get a fluorescent color. Uh, fluorescent, and so we have fluorescence under UV light, right? And so uh, in this picture, the one at the top, this is pool B, uh, our positive control, which is a culture of enterococcus, and pool A looked exactly like this one, where every single well here is fluorescing, right? And then the way that this works is you, you add up how many of your wells are fluorescing and look at a most probable number table and figure out your estimate then from there, how many cells per ml were in the sample, all right? So pool A and pool B look just like the positive control, all, all positive. The bottom one here is pool C, where you could see that we have a lot um, less positive wells here, so a much lower number. So if I go back here, uh, since all the wells are positive for pool A and pool B, that means more than 2,419.6 cells in each 100 mLs of water sample, right? 
whereas uh, which is much higher than what's recommended. The recommended numbers are down here. Uh, should be uh, for fresh water, uh, 33 CFUs. For us, it's it's a cell an estimate of cell count, right, in 100 ml. So we're way way above that here. But pool C, again, pool C is kind of an outlier here, right? Is uh, showing a much lower number of these cells within the acceptable range and reference pool no water on this day so we don't know all right so uh, we looked at this already here's fall 2019 our invertebrate survey which we used to standard methods with a, a dip net to take some uh, sediment samples uh, put them in alcohol brought them back in the lab and then uh, brady and some other folks from uh from parks came and helped my students sort through them and uh, kind of do a account for um, what types of invertebrates we're seeing. We, we didn't get too far into the very specific taxa. We mostly were at the family level here. Um, but we can see uh, differences in the, in the uh, invertebrates, benthic invertebrates that um, are found here, all right? So this this natural pool is not our natural pool. It's another pool because we we didn't take samples there that day. Um, but that one had a lot of diptera, whereas our pools have um, pool A specifically has uh, pool A is the orange has mollusca. So this is a almost exclusively a freshwater snail found in that pool, um, whereas you have more um, odonates in uh, pool B and also pool C and a lot less in pool C, right? And also uh, some coronamids in pool B. So we have differences in which benthic invertebrates are showing up in these pools, right? Um, and this is a, just based on the level of taxa we were able to get to, this is a diversity index. Our most diverse pool would be pool uh, B and our lowest calculation for uh, species diversity um, would be pool C. Okay, uh, this is showing a uh, metagenomic I analysis. This, Sorry? Wouldn't the most, oh, most diverse pool be the natural pool? So that, yeah, that, that would be, that's a natural pool, but that's not our, it's not the natural pool at the site. I understand, right? thank yeah, you. So, so that, yeah, so that, that one based on this, on this calculation, you're right, is, is the highest, but um, I'm not really emphasizing this one because it's not part of our site, it's not our control pool. We have to get back in there and get a sample from that one. Okay. Okay. Um, and now, so now we're finally getting to the microbes. This is the exciting part you've all been waiting for, right? Uh, so using a metagenomic approach, which is expensive, so we needed that outside funding from, uh, from the Aram folks. And uh, just very briefly, this is where you would take a, a sample. So we have soil samples, water samples, and you extract DNA from that whole community. So rather than growing bacteria in a petri dish and looking at each species individually, and we know that a lot of bacteria in nature are not gonna grow in that petri dish anyway, this is a way of seeing who's out there in the whole, looking at the whole community at once by looking at uh, DNA sequence. So our, we did in, in the lab, we extracted DNA from both soil and water samples. This is going back to fall 2018, by the way. So we do have water in that reference pool. Uh, we send those samples out, they get uh, the 16S ribosomal RNA gene gets uh, sequenced. So all the bacteria have them, right? And then grouped, right? Identified based on sequence and how many times these sequences show up, give you an estimate of which bacteria, which taxa are there, and then their relative abundance in the community. All right, and so then from these data, we calculated our alpha and beta diversity, which we'll look at at the next slide. Uh, here, we're gonna be looking at the taxonomic level of order. And uh, you'll see why when you look at the, the graphs, you uh, can go lower, but there's so many different taxa that come up that then you, you can't look at it in one graph. So order or family is where most of these studies will, uh, is the level that most of these studies focus on. So here are the results of that microbial community analysis. Uh, the graph on the left is just showing how many sequences were found in each of those samples. So everything in green here are the soil samples and the blue are the water samples, right? And so you can see overall, uh, we got more sequences out of the soil samples. 
so more individual uh, microbes there in the soil, which makes sense because that's what showed up in our plate counts too. We expect higher numbers of of bacteria in soil than in the uh, water samples, right? On the right here, this is a Shannon diversity index, and we also uh, calculated the diversity index with, with a few other, in a few different ways, but the pattern is always kind of the same where we have higher diversity in our soil samples than in the water samples, right? And, uh, and then now this is ter in terms of bacteria, and the lowest one, lowest number of hits in terms of sequence, and also lowest in terms of, uh, of diversity index would be uh, pool C. This graph shows this is a principal components analysis, which is basically looking at that all of that DNA data from all of those sequences, which the, you saw the numbers on the uh, last slide, right? And then the taxa that we're identifying. And then using the, all of that data to figure out which which samples are most closely related or most distantly related to each other, right? Uh, over as a whole, as a community. And uh, so if you look over here, this where it says control, that's the reference pool, right? Uh, you see uh, uh, over here, this cluster here, where the three green uh, diamonds are the soil samples with the, uh, the reference one being this slightly browner color, right? And you can see how they're all um, grouping over here right, together. So they are pretty similar to each other, right? Not, not identical, but they're kind of forming a cluster over here on this part of the graph. Whereas when we look at the water samples, we've got uh, much more of a distance between them, so that means they're more dissimilar, right? So they're more dissimilar from each other, we see, than, than anyone is here from the, uh, from the soil samples. And the soil samples kind of clustering together. Right uh, of our water samples, of pool A is most similar to the reference pool in terms of the microbial community, and then pools B and C are kind of close together, but a little bit further apart than our soil cluster still. All right. So these graphs are showing the uh, the taxa at the order level, right? And so you can see then how many different lines we end up with at uh, the order level. If you go to family or something more specific, it gets even messier, right? Um, and so the ones on the uh, left are um, the soil samples and the ones on the right are the water samples, right? And, and so just looking at these, I think it's, you can kind of see that it sticks out that the soil samples we have some variability in the exact size of, of these bars. So let me just backtrack and explain. So each of these different colors is representing a different bacterial order, right? Uh, I have the slides that are interactive where I can hover over them and it shows you what they are at the end. Um, if we have time, we can look at those, right? Um, but so this purple here is the same taxa as the purple here, right? So those are the, the same organisms. But just overall big picture, when you're looking at the four soil samples, they look very similar in terms of the, of the composition, right? Again, you're gonna have some variability in the size or relative abundance of these individual taxa in the graph, but the pattern is very much the same. Whereas when you come over here and on the right and look at the water samples, right? Reference pool is the, the first one here, and then you've got pools A, B, and C. Remember C is our outlier. Um, you see that they're not, they don't look as similar, right? And that's what we saw in the previous graph that they have more differences. They do share a lot of the same taxa, um, but the relative abundance are, are differences. And then there are some taxa that are much more abundant in certain pools and either absent or very little of them in, in the other pools, right? And so what this is telling us, so all right, the soils, the, you know, the soil is the soil as it was before the, uh, the construction of the pools, right? But these water samples are done in different ways and they are developing uh, different, ta different microbial taxa in terms of bacteria, right? Uh, this very big table shows some of the more common taxa that were found. Again, left is the soil, right is the, uh, the water. All right, and the ones in red are the ones that were found uh, in both. And, and there are others that are found in both, but some of them just in very small amounts, right? These were uh, 
similar uh, relative abundance um, in both. So again, this is at the order level, saprospirales, which are known to be saprophytic, they're decomposers, right? Um, actinomycetales, um, in this group, we would have our actinomycetes, or those uh, microbes that produce the secondary compounds, like um, some of them are antibacterial, right? Um, which we did look for, and, and I'm not really talking much about that today because uh, surprisingly, we, we didn't really find too, uh, streptomyces in these, uh, in these samples. Um, so we do have a, a few things that are in common, but a whole bunch of things that are much more prominent in one pool than the other. Uh, these up here, you see where it says III 1 to 15 and DS 18, and there are others in the, in the, uh, in the graphs. What this means is this is an environmental sample that doesn't exist in, in culture. That means someone else that did a metagenomic study uh, basically you know, came across this and these are the names of their, uh, from, the, from their studies, right? So it, it doesn't exist in culture. So we can't say much about it, although it seems that a lot of the environmental samples that don't have identifications at the order level are uh, similar if you look at the individual sequences to acidobacteria, uh, which is a kind of an order that, that's been sort of realized and, and discovered by metagenomics because um, nobody really talked a lot about acidobacteria before these types of studies were done and then it kept showing up everywhere. So it's obviously pretty important um, in these natural samples, right? And then um, you can also see that 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 um, there are differences in, in some of them. Uh, we have Burkholderiae is very prevalent in pool A. Uh, here you have some in the other pool other soil samples, and it shows up in the water also, but much less. All right. Um, interesting in the water taxa, we have some methanotrophs uh, that are showing up that that use methane for an energy source. So that's of interest to me. This one too is interesting that we have more rhizobiales in the in the pools than we have in the soil. Uh, this is one of the organisms that we associate with with plant roots. They're nitrogen fixers and they're associated with plant roots, but they could be associated with the vegetation that's growing in these shallow pools as well. Uh, but not much of a presence of them over in the soil. So that kind of summarizes that stuff. Well, I just saw that. Nikita's here, and there's Nikita right there. All right, uh, so conclusions. What did we learn from, from doing this? So overall, our big picture, putting all of this survey data together, is that uh, pool A is acting most like the reference pool, and, and it's showing similar characteristics. It didn't dry completely, but it, is, it does get the driest. And um, so it, it's acting of any of them, it's acting the most like that natural uh, reference pool, right? Only the reference pool dried completely in 2019. Uh, pools B and C seems like uh, maybe having that liner in, you know, held too much water uh, from being able to drain, and so they're acting more like ponds at this point, uh, which does not mean they won't support some uh, good, you know, support, make some good habitat for some organisms, but. Um, they're probably not going to become vernal pools just right now. Fishless uh, ponds, right? Um, we see unique assemblages of invertebrates at the pools. Uh, we do have uh, those samples still in jars to go back and look at and try to get a better identification, more specific identification. Um, that just hasn't happened yet, um, but hopefully we will we'll be able to do that. In terms of water and soil quality, um, we have a lot of variability with our collection dates. Um, on some of our collection dates, some of these uh, parameters like phosphor, uh, phosphorus, dissolved oxygen, nitrogen, um, were not always in acceptable ranges, but, and they were variable at different times of the year that, and, and the two years that we sampled in the fall. Uh, Pool C seems that we have a, a higher pH for some reason over there. That pH is, has increased from uh, the onset of, of the creation of the pools. Also has the lowest bacterial counts by, by plate. And the other two pools, uh, constructed pools A and B, had very, very high levels of, of enterococci, but very low levels at, at pool C. So something different is happening at, at pool C. 
And as I mentioned, we didn't really find actinomycetes, which is surprising usually. You go out and take a soil sample anywhere, you find actinomycetes, but um, the soil is very sandy. And uh, so they maybe that they don't like this type of soil. They're not very happy there, but that's something that we can explore further as well. All right, in terms of our community analysis, um, higher diversity observed in the soil communities than in aquatic communities. That's uh, usually the case, so that's not a surprise. We did see that the soil bacterial communities were much more similar to each other, um, whereas the aquatic pools were more distinct from each other, but the ones that were closest, more closely related was uh, the reference pool with pool A, which is the, the unlined one that does get shallow. It doesn't, uh, didn't dry completely, but did get shallower. So those two seem to be more similar in their microbial composition as well. And then there were some taxa uh, shared in, in common with the soil and the water, but also a, a number of unique taxa that were found in only the water or in only the soil. All right, uh, so this is a, a lot of kind of, you know, let's see what's out there, what we want to see, what we want to explore in the, in the future. All right, uh, so uh, things to keep in mind though is that uh, we're not, we were not sampling regularly. We haven't been out there since fall 2019, which is kind of heartbreaking. Um, first year, we're just using Lamotte kits, which if you're familiar with those, you're, you know, getting a color reaction and comparing to a, a little chart with colors, so you can't really be very quantifiable there and, and very accurate. Um, our technology there improved a bit when we got the YSI meter to do some of the uh, parameters later on, but we need more replicates um, and a more standardized way of doing the sampling so that we can re uh, you know, have more reliable data there. Uh, metagenomics, like I said, is expensive, so we only got one time, time point, and, and we know there's a number of studies that have been done that when you look at uh, both temporal and spatial variability, there's a lot of variability, right? And so really you should be out there doing regular uh, time points, um, different locations, even uh, within the pool area uh, to see what's going on there. So more sampling needs to be done in all of these areas to help us get more uh, information and try to figure out what's happening at these vernal pools and updated data. You know, how did the vernal pools do in the, in the pandemic? We don't know, right? So our next steps are to get vaccinated. Uh, I've got one out of two so far. Get rid of this pandemic so that we can get back into the lab here. These are students sorting through invertebrates with the uh, parks personnel here. Um, and, and get back into the field too. This is taking the invertebrate samples in the field, the picture at the bottom. Uh, standardize our sampling methods. So we're always using the same methods to measure the water quality parameter. So we don't have to worry about variation just due to the fact that we've used a, a different sampling or uh, analysis method, right? Including the microbial analysis. Get back to those invertebrates, see if that pattern where they have different invertebrates is still holding up or are they becoming more similar now as, as time has gone on? Be interesting to know. Um, I would also like to look at the phytoplankton and zooplankton, um, both in terms of identification and quantifying. Uh, just a very brief survey I did with uh, one student, Ashley Mercado, uh, showed that uh, there's, there were much higher numbers of zooplankton in the reference pool and uh, very um, seems like a lot of Daphnia or water flea, whereas the other pools had uh, a different composition. So I'd like to get back at looking at that as well. And that's all I have to say. It was a great pleasure working with all of these students. Here you see some of the students out here in the field. And um, I really hope that we can get back to seeing what's going on to this pool and um, working together rather than seeing each other in little boxes on a computer. But thank you. I'm happy to take your questions. Well, thank you. That was a great talk. I've been there many times to Alley Pond Park, but I never thought, of, I never saw it in that way. Thank you. So <laughs> I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, you can either unmute yourself and ask a question, or if you're a little shy, you can always type a question as well. So any questions so, so far? I'll, I'll ask a quick question, Jillian. Um, mm -hmm. Does the 
do the parks have a, a sampling scheme or anything to do to follow up once they build these things? I mean, it seems odd that they would just make them and walk away. So that's a great question for if Brady. Brady is here. She's a parks ecologist that I work with on this, and I, I think she would love to handle that question. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, I think um, overall monitoring is left to a very, very small team, and we have to cover every single salt marsh, forest restoration, and freshwater restoration uh, citywide. So um, my team is a, comprised of three people. <laughs> so you can imagine it's really, really hard to um, cover all of those bases um, on top of uh, other responsibilities. So we were able to monitor um, the temperature and water depth, water depth and some chemistry. But when it comes to these other big lifts, such as the invertebrates, um, and um, you know, tracking what we hope to track in the future, vegetation and everything else, that's where we bring in other stakeholders and these educational opportunities to augment our own monitoring. Um, so we definitely don't have the funds to do any of it. All of it is a matter of whether full-time staff can dice up whatever time they have across the five boroughs. Wow. Okay. Thank you. That's a big job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Brady. I was just going to say that's why partnerships like this with Queensbury Community College are so important to, you know, hopefully augment their own, you know, curriculum, but um, it gives us invaluable data um, in order to plan future restorations. Right, I would, that's exactly what I was going to say, actually. This is a win-win because, you know, I would be teaching an environmental science lab, you know, soil, soil parameters, water, chem, water chemistry, I'd be teaching those things anyway, but here, this allows us to do this in the field, but also provide data you know to, to, to parks that they can use uh, so it was definitely a win-win and um, you know there's some interesting things going on here that I'd like to get back to and, and see you know what's going on great hopefully Thank we you. can do that mm -hmm. John a, a related question um, at one point Queens got most of its water from wells and as we as we were weaned from wells and, and now use New York City water, I assume the water table has risen. And have we lost vernal pools? Have they become ponds as a result of that? So were there more vernal pools before that are now classified as ponds? Um, in New York, in, you're talking about in New York City in, specifically. In uh, in Queens, um, I don't. I don't have it. Maybe Brady can can answer that. I'm. I'm not sure. That's, I think. Yeah, there, that's a good are, question. I'm not. There are less we, vernal pools in in Queens just because of development, but I don't know right. if they converted. Yeah, before. I think it's more filling in. Um, I think what you're alluding to, um, maybe our kettle ponds, our traditional kettle ponds that we have in Alley Pond, kind of what I call Alley Pond proper across the Cross Island yeah. um, Expressway. I think. Um, you know, maybe those did have, you know, some drying periods where they're, they're pretty static now. Um, so yeah, it's a really good question. Usually we kind of think about it in the other direction as far as, you know, CSOs and, um, you know, some right. of the problems that Douglaston still struggles with, um, with septic systems and things like that. But um, that's a good question. I'll have to pass that along to some of our um, hydrologists. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, here's an interesting question. Um, hi, Joan. Hi, George. Um, I thought something that might be interesting with these uh, four ponds that you have is to measure the infiltration rates. Now, it's going to be zero in the pond, in the lined ponds. But uh, you can calculate the infiltration rates, I think, just by mass, mass balance. Uh, just looking at the volumes, the evapotranspiration, which may be estimated one way or another, and, and the estimated amount of sunlight. And that's a sort of exercise that students can do pretty readily uh, over the season. So I think just from a teaching point of view, that'd be nice and introduce them to the concept of mass and leakage and mm -hmm. making a balance of some kind, that, which is nice. One of the nice things you can do with limnology. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that sounds good. I, you know, one of, one of the limitations we, we had is when I have these classes offered. So, um, you know, it, it's a small program, so I, I got to the point that now oh, sure. both of them are only offered in the fall. Uh -huh. um, but I could do that with a research student, maybe, you yeah. know, a CUNY scholar or some, some where we could go out, because we do need to have like 
monthly sampling or something. It, it can't just be, you know, the one semester. Well, you, kinda, you know, you look at it when it's full and then maybe when it's at, at its lowest and, right. you know, just look Absolutely. at it. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. Anyway, just thought I'd suggest that. Yeah, no, it's a good suggestion. I, and I, I actually, I, I struggle with that because I'm like, well, if I if I move them both to the fall, then I don't have some students doing any monitoring in, in the spring semester. Uh, but really the decision was made because of the number of weeks that you get in the field oh, yeah. in, the, in the fall versus the spring. You know, by the time we can get out there and anything is, is happening, we're taking finals in the spring semester, right? <laughs> Whereas in the fall, we're out there from August, we have, we have, uh, more time, but yeah, it would have to be something that, you know, we should work on. And Brady and I did a, a, actually apply for a grant with a, another colleague, my my PhD mentor at, at Fordham, um, that uh, it wasn't funded, but uh, we should try again, and then we could have people that are, you know, on this all the time. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's it. I just wanted to add to that's a great suggestion, because we, um, especially with the spring students, one of the things that we had to realize was just the cadence of kind of the, you know, the dormancy at the site. So it's the spring students, we couldn't get them out late enough um, to where vegetation was present and the invertebrates um, were present and things like that. So it's like the fall students were really able to capture what was on site, but the spring um, we've always wrestled with what to monitor um, because they have to meet so early in the season that everything's just kind of dormant. Right. So, you know, and, and it's come up a few times. You're like, this needs to be a like a summer e ecology methods class. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it should, and, um, but it just hasn't happened yet. You know, we look forward to our summers, right? <laughs> Everybody does. Nice yeah. <laughs> okay, so, um, oh, we do have a question here from a student. Okay. Um, they were curious about in terms of the methods, what did you utilize for a biogeochemical analysis of the nutrients, like nitrate? Uh, so that that was different in, in different semesters. So that, that and, and you know, that's one of the things I mentioned as a limitation is, uh, you know, the first semester, right, you learned about these vernal pools, like, hey, let's go out and sample. And we took samples and all I have back in the lab are, are these Lamott kits. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but you know you're you're comparing for pH if it if it's this color, it's pH six. If it's this color, it's pH seven. So it's very hard to be very precise um, with with those. Um, we then in the I think starting in the spring semester, we also did some stuff with hatch kits, which then gave us some more quantifiable uh, data and um, and then uh, some of the parameters uh, in the fall 2019, I was able to get a YSI meter, which is just, you know, you have the probes on there that will test for uh, some of your parameters like pH and DO and stuff, and you just drop it in the water and it gives you the readings. And so those I would probably consider the, the, the most reliable. And then because we were able to do that so easily, we could go and check different parts of the pond of the pools and you know see that yeah okay that numbers are reliable and look for any variability in, in just even different regions of the pool um, but that was only available starting fall 2019 so you know when we eventually get back to this location and, and can do this uh, a better analysis would be you know to standardize that we're always using the same methods each time so that then we can compare, you know, I, I didn't put those like those pH values on one on one graph showing it was this pH here and then this pH because they were tested in different ways and I didn't feel that was a fair uh, comparison, right? We kind of can compare them within each other, but, um, and, and definitely that high pH at pool C is uh, something's going on there. But um, I would really like to just have a standard way that every time we go and test, we're testing this way uh, so that the results are are more comparable. And we may have to drop out like now, now you know, this we kind of saw now, there's no need to monitor on a regular basis, the aluminum and the iron, those other things that are not showing up as being anything, you know, now we can just hone in maybe on the things that are showing up as being uh, questionable or different between the pools. We have one more question actually from, okay. uh, yeah. So do you expect the variations 
um, in the different pools. Well, let me say, actually, I just got another question. So do you expect variation in the pool's microbial diversity and the water to become more similar to each other over time? That's a really good question. Um, and, and I wish I had an answer for that. I, I, my guess would be yes. Um, if they're behaving similarly. So what I would actually expect would be maybe actually what we even saw in the snapshot, right? So with, with the uh, reference pool and pool A, which is almost sort of kind of drying, right? To be more similar and then pools B and C that are actually more like small ponds at this point to be more different. And, and that is what we saw in that snapshot. Um, maybe pools pools B and C would become more similar, although pool C does have that other different water chemistry there and different microbial counts in, in uh, pool C. So yeah, I just want to get out there and find out. <laughs> um, but I, I would expect, uh, if we look at the soils, the soils are pretty, you know, pretty similar, right? Actually, Remarkably similar if you if you look at the, the the way that those graphs came out because they've been you know that That soil there for all of this time the pools you, with, with who shows up first could just be you know priority effect This micro got to this pool first, but then it's going to be You know out competed by a different microbe but, um, And we also my, have you know varying impact or you know in, inputs over you know we have different critters using different pools. Like now we have a muskrat living in pool A. Um, you know, so there's different, you know, there's different things going on. There's a lot of research now indicating how ducks move around, waterfowl moves around invertebrates, um, uh, you know, through fecal posits. So there's, you know, it depends on who's using it and who's using it. The, the, two, com the two common denominators we have is, you know, pool A does not have a liner and is you know, kind of closely um, tailored to, to the control pool, whereas um, pool C and B um, have those liners and are not, their water levels are, are not changing all that much. So um, we'll see if that, that seems to influence that, that uh, track record. And uh, as a follow-up, um, uh, one student asked, uh, can we see the maps of the pools again? Because the location could be an indicator why A and B is just so dissimilar. So yep, yeah, the reference pool and and uh, pool A are also physically closest to each other. Okay. This, this pool, this picture, I guess, would be the best one yeah. to look at, right? So the the path where you would walk in in between this uh, car car lot and and the I think it's a a car wash, right? Um, is is here, and then reference mm, yeah. pool A is here, and then. Pools B and C are, are back here and a little bit further away from these two. So, so there is, yeah, it could be, uh, you know, and that's one of the things in the, in the paper that I, I sent ahead to read is, you know, it's one of the questions too, is it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's this distance effect that you see in other organisms with how well they can disperse. But, uh, does that apply to your bacterial community? I don't know. You know, and the other thing is, you know, we, we looked at bacteria. We, we did not look at the, the other prokaryotes, the, the archaea, which may or may not be present there. And we didn't look at fungi. Mm -hmm. um, I have read some things that when you're in uh, like vernal pools or, or small ponds in urban areas tend to have more fungal diversity. It goes up, you know, so we don't have that whole big picture either, you know. Um. And so Alan asks, uh, what about the pH differences? Could that affect the biota? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think particularly in, in Pool C where it's got that, that pH that is pretty high for these. You'd expect these to be somewhat on a little bit on the acidic side, but it, um, it increased and seemed to be at least up until the last time we monitored it, it was continuing um, to increase. And, and yeah, you have organisms that, you know, have a broad range and they can kind of survive in a lot of different locations and then you have others that would have very unique uh, requirements and that pH may be too high for some organisms and then others would would flourish since they're not competing with those other ones that can't survive there absolutely well what it's worth and Brady may know this already we used to use uh, glo we used to use, do globe measurements at Meadow Lake um, and we got a pH 
at the northwest corner of about close to 11. Wow. Yeah, Meadow Lake is crazy. <laughs> well, Meadow, but that, that was landfill that was fly ash. Yep. So yep. That I expect, and I'm just wondering what, you know, I, but I don't see an easy reason for having nine point something in, in, in the vernal pools that you're talking about. So I, no. Not fly yeah. ash. So and this, this particular site is LaGuardia soil. So um, pulling from NRCS's urban soil survey that they did in 2013, 2014. Um, this is one of the anthrop anthropogenic soils that they like literally had to create new soil taxonomy to right. apply to New York City um, <laughs> right. because it doesn't fit anywhere else. Um, so these are the LaGuardia soil series, which would point back to what you're talking about with Meadow Lake and Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Um, which has similar soil taxonomy. Right. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely has the the, the problems with um, a lot of construction debris, i.e., uh, concrete, um, you know, uh, alkaline um, creating kind of substrate. Yep. Yeah, but it, it's interesting though that only in in this pool, not not pool B, is not didn't have that, and then they do have, uh, you know differences in other things like the the just the total count and and the the enterococcus as well very low here and very high in these two so um, another question um, since um, salt water this was originally salt water marsh and then it was filled in has there been any ecologically has this been ecologically resolved can you still tell uh, on a species level that there's a legacy of being brackish environment uh, for example, Alley, um, Alley Creek is still connected to the Long Island Sound. I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm sorry. Could you? Oh, read it again? Yeah. Oh, and like, Brady, did you did you oh, get it? Brady? I'm yeah. Very as far as the salinity <laughs> in the pools, um, anytime. Yeah, and I think um, you know Parks knows and understands that anytime you um, fill in a salt marsh, it's going to want to um, sink back down into that original form. So our land, you know, this is, this part of Alley Creek, of course, is, you know, the old legacy of Robert Moses with the Cross Island Parkway um, construction and all the construction debris, that's what has created this land mass that we now have put vernal pools on. Um, so the same can be said a lot, you know, a lot of parks in Queens. Um, so that, yes, that legacy, that, that salt marsh wants to return to a salt marsh, um, which it's going to try to do over the next, long after we're all gone. Um, <laughs> and, you know, who knows what will happen to our little bird of pools. But, um, uh, but yeah, the, we did test the salinity and um, there yeah. wasn't, it, it did, it, there wasn't, it was very, um, very minimal. So yeah. right now. Undetected or, or minimal. You know, so yeah, so whatever water is going, it's you know, it's fresh water going through these ponds. Okay. Yes. Any last questions then? Because it's almost 1.30 at this point. So otherwise, uh, I want to thank you again for um, 